Woodland Christian Church. Woodland Christian Church. Woodland Christian Church. Woodland Christian Church is a church that advocates biblical justice. At Woodland, we learn what it really means to be a Christian. We are stewardship and service. We encourage communion through worship and fellowship. We are committed to transforming lives through advocacy and discipleship. Woodland is a church where all are welcome. We prioritize people over anything else. Our core values are hospitality, justice, service, love, fellowship, discipleship, evangelism. We are committed to growth and the wellness of mind, body, and spirit. I attend Woodland Christian Church because I feel the love and the acceptance of God. Come grow with us. We are Woodland. 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 We Woodland. We are Woodland. We are Woodland. We are Woodland. Good morning and welcome once again to another Rejoice Power Hour live stream morning worship service of the Woodland Christian Church. Good morning to you in the sanctuary. Good morning uh, to you who are watching by live stream and to you who are listening by telephone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As is our custom, the first thing we'd like to do before we officially begin our worship service is to share with you some announcements. So here we go. I uh, always want to thank you for wearing your mask in the sanctuary. When you come into the sanctuary of Woodland, we thank you for wearing your mask. You have been very cooperative all these three years of this pandemic. We thank you uh, for your cooperation in wearing a mask when you come into the sanctuary. Thank you so much. Then today is Pentecost Sunday. We will receive our annual Pentecost offering starting today and next Sunday. We thank you for your contributions above your regular giving. Tomorrow, June the 6th, uh, tomorrow, uh, the trustees will meet at 1 o'clock p.m. And the executive team will meet tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. And the executive team, uh, the five board officers, the chair of the elders or representative, chair of the trustees or representative, chair of the diaconate or representative, uh, we need you to be at the meeting tomorrow at 6.30. One o'clock trustees meeting tomorrow here at the church and 6.30 tomorrow the executive team. Choir rehearsal is canceled this Tuesday. Choir rehearsal is canceled this Tuesday. Wednesday Bible study is 6.30 p.m. And the elders then will meet this coming Saturday on June the 11th at 2 o'clock p.m. via WebEx. Then on Saturday, June the 25th at 4 o'clock here at Woodland, the men and women of Northwest United Methodist Church are coming to meet with us. Uh, this is part of our monthly meetings on systemic racism. We were at Northwest last month. This month, June the 25th, they will be coming to us. We will be hosting that meeting on June the 25th. Then the stewardship team is asking that when you use an offering envelope, be sure you put your first and last name on the envelope so that there's no confusion as to who you are. Guests, please add your uh, email address on the envelope as well because early next year, the stewardship team will be issuing individual financial reports on your 2022 financial stewardship so that you can use them for tax purposes. So thank you for putting your full name, first and last name, on your envelopes when you are making your uh, contributions. Thank you very much. As always, when you shop for groceries, even during this inflation, time of inflation, please remember to buy one canned good or one dry good to donate to the St. Philip's Episcopal Church Food Pantry. And we thank you for your contributions. 
All right, and then I'd like you to put August the 13th on your calendar. Uh, the 13th, Northwest and Woodland, uh, specifically Chris Rinker, Associate Pastor of Northwest and myself, uh, are planning an anti one day anti racism retreat on August the 13th. So put that on your calendars. We'll do more talking about that in the future. Uh, we did receive a grant from the Ohio Regions Pro Reconciliation Anti Racism Commission. And so we are moving forward with that uh, anti-racism retreat. Uh, registration will be, there's a registration fee, it'll be just ten dollars uh, and we will be rounding up folks for registration in the coming weeks. But we'd like you to put August the 13th on your calendars now for uh, the anti-racism retreat. <clears throat> then please remember to pray for Sister Kay Henry, Sister Star Lee Robbins, Sister Bobby Hunt, Brother Bill Banks, Deacon Arliss White, and Sister Melba Red. Uh, thank you for praying for our shut-in members. Also, Reverend Marianne Glover has a mentor whom she calls her play mother, who is 82 years old and has been admitted into the hospital. Marianne asks us to pray for her play mother, and so we thank you for doing that. Also. Dr. Jack Sullivan just informed me a few minutes ago that one of his neighbors passed away and the family knows he's a minister so he is right now ministering to that the, the neighbor passed away this morning and so he right now is ministering to the family in his neighborhood and so uh, be in prayer for that family don't know the name or anything yet but uh, be in prayer for that family and Dr. Sullivan as he ministers to them. Thank you for governing yourselves accordingly. We are now in the hands of Elder Raymond Taylor. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord, church. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Please stand as you're able uh, for our call to worship, please. Come, Holy Spirit. Ignite our hearts with joy and confidence. God has done wondrous things for us. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us with the power of rushing wine, wind that we may faithfully serve you in all that we do. For Christ has called each of us and blessed us. Come, Holy Spirit, be with us today. Help us all boldly proclaim Christ risen. Amen. 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 Please remain stay, standing as we welcome our praise and worship. Amen.
out. He brought me 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 out. And he holds my hand. 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 And he walked with me. Let us continue to lift our hearts with open mind as we do our worship and mission statement. Let us begin transforming on the inside to do the intentional work of advocacy and discipleship on the outside through growth, giving, relationships, outreach, worship, teaching, and healing. Amen. Amen. Let us be in prayer. Amazing God. Amazing God. On this Pentecost Sunday, you call us today. Just as you called the disciples on the first day of Pentecost, you challenge and support us, revealing the brokenness of our communities, giving us the peace that our world needs. You point us to the pain of the cross and then remind us 
of the joy of the resurrection. Transform us, O God, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us breathe deeply of the breath of life. Blow through the worship and change our lives forever. Amen. Amen. Welcome to Woodland Christian Church. Whether you are joining us in person, online, or by conference call, we are excited that you are worshiping with us today. If this is your first time worshiping with us, we invite you to make yourself at home because at Woodland, we are all family. Allow the Spirit to move in you as we lift praises and worship to our God. If you need anything at any point during the service, please see an usher here in the sanctuary or write a comment in the chat box if you are joining us online. We will be happy to help you. We pray that you enjoy the worship service and that you will worship with us again. On behalf of our senior pastor, Dr. Eric Brown, and our entire church family, welcome to Woodland, a church of transformation. Hello, disciples. On May 14th, when I was driving to Iowa to install the new regional minister of the Upper Midwest region, I heard on my radio in my car about the shooting in Buffalo. It began to dawn on me the more details I heard that the shooting, the massacre, had occurred in a black neighborhood, in a grocery store that represented the sole grocery store in that neighborhood, an area that had been and still is really a food desert. Once again, assault weapons. Once again, hatred. Once again, some distorted understanding that uh, there is a replacement theory that black and brown people are here to replace white people. Tuesday, May 25th in Uvalde, Texas, at present count 19 elementary school children. Once again, assault weapons. Hatred has no place in our world. Racism has no place in our world. We are Christians, yes, we are followers of Jesus Christ and we will pray. But right now, church, I need you to pray and then rise from your knees, seeking what God would have you to do. Wherever you have the opportunity to advocate for the right, to advocate for truth, I pray that you will do it considering what the alternative to this unjust society looks like.
life was bound by sin That's when he took me in He did it all on Calvary Calvary, oh what it means If you will bow your head with me and breathe, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, take some real deep breaths. Recognize that every breath you take is a breath of life from God. Experience the presence of God in this place. God loves you. God cares about you. And God wants what's best for you. God woke us up this morning, watched over us as we slept last night, he gathered us here today and other Christians to their places of worship so that we could all give God glory and praise. And God is worthy to be praised. Then focus on Jesus. He went to Calvary for you. Jesus took our place 
as sinners. He took our place on the cross and died to rescue us from our sins. He is the great shepherd. He is the rock in the weary land, the shelter in a time of storm. He walks with us and talks with us, tells us that we are his own. We have fellowship with God because of Jesus. We have a relationship with God because of Jesus. And Jesus is worthy of our praise. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Break us, melt us, mold us, fill us, and use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Holy Spirit of God, we thank you once again for using us in a worship service. This worship service, we thank you. We thank you for the songs we have sung, the prayers we have prayed, the scriptures that we have read. We thank you, Lord, for what we will sing and what we will pray and the scriptures we will read and Lord's Supper we will receive. Later on in this service, we thank you because we know that without you, we can do nothing. We thank you, Lord. For blessing those who are sick today, we thank you for healing the sick today. We thank you, Lord, for being with our shut-ins today. We thank you for letting them know you have not forsaken nor forgotten them, and you are present with them where they are. We thank you for blessing Dr. Sullivan, using Dr. Sullivan as he ministers to his neighbor's family who passed away this morning. We thank you, Lord. We acknowledge that there are those who have been pronounced terminally ill by doctors and without a miracle from you must knowingly face the end of their lives. We pray for their strength and peace today. We take seriously the words of the Apostle Paul to be absent from our bodies is to be present with you. We thank you for strengthening and comforting those who must knowingly face the end of their lives. We ask your blessings upon those who have lost loved ones through death this past week. And yet again, we ask your blessings of comfort upon families who lost loved ones through violence. As violence continues to happen all over this nation each and every day. We pray for those who are in grief and who are mourning because of the death of a loved one. We thank you for those who made phone calls and visits, sent cards and flowers to the bereaved. They rep tried to represent you as comforters. And we know it's difficult to comfort people in times like this. But Lord, we know what you can do with the seeds of comfort that were sown in their hearts. We know you can reap in their hearts the comfort and peace and strength you know that they need. And so we give you thanks for comforting bereaved folks today. We ask your blessings upon people who are struggling to find baby formula today. Parents who are worried about feeding their babies. We pray for them today. We pray for folks who are in trouble. We pray for folks who are struggling. We pray for people in prison today. We pray for the homeless. We pray for folks today, Lord, who don't feel like worshiping you because either they're too sorrowful or they're too angry to want to give you any attention today. We pray for them. We know you understand. And we pray for them today. We pray for peace in Ukraine, peace in Yemen, and peace in Ethiopia, and Somalia, and the Sudan, and Cameroon, and Nigeria today. We pray for your peace, Lord, all over this world. We pray for the people who need peace in their hearts. 
We pray for them today. We thank you for meeting the needs of people. We know that you know better than we do what people need and what each individual needs in their lives today. And we thank you, Lord, for meeting our needs as you see fit. We now ask that you be with me as I prepare to bring a message from you to your people. As always, I ask someone here will find something in the message that will help them in their daily living. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Say, hallelujah. hallelujah. Say, praise the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord some praise in his house this morning. He is worthy of our praise. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles on your electronic devices or a printed Bible like me, turn to the letter of 1 John. The letter of 1 John, back there next to Revelation in the New Testament. 1 John, chapter 1, beginning with verses, verse 5. I'll be reading verses 5 through 10 in 1 John, chapter 1. When you have found it, say amen. I'll be reading from the New International Version. It'll be a little, might be a little different from your translation, but it shouldn't be too difficult to follow along. First John chapter one, verses five through 10. Do we all have it yet? All right. Give the folks at home a few more minutes, although the scripture is on the screen. Amen. My translation reads like this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In God there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with God and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, God's son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he, Jesus, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. This is the word of God. It can be trusted. I'd like to address you all today from the subject, the solution for darkness, light. The solution for darkness light. This Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. This is the Sunday we celebrate the beginning of the church by the Holy Spirit recorded in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit created the church to continue the ministries of Jesus. One of those ministries is to shine God's light in a dark world. The year was 2007. An action movie was released to the theater circuit called The 300. The movie was about the ancient Spartans of Greece and their king, Leonidas. When he was informed that the massive Persian army was coming to conquer Greece, Leonidas decided that he could take 300 of his most skilled warriors and hold off an unimaginable number of Persians at a narrow pass located at a place called Thermopylae. As the 300 Spartans marched to Thermopylae, people in villages along the way heard that 300 of the most valiant Spartans were going to Thermopylae to fight thousands 
of Persians. Men from those villages would meet the 300 on their way to Thermopylae and ask Leonidas to let them join him and the other Spartans to defend Greece against the Persians. In the movie, about 15 men from a village met Leonidas and the 300 on their way. They asked to join them in fighting against the Persians. Leonidas looked at them with a smirk on his face and he asked one of them, you, what is your profession? He replied, I'm a farmer. Leonidas asked another man, you, what is your profession? He answered, I'm a carpenter. Leonidas asked a third would-be volunteer, what is your profession? He said, I'm a blacksmith. With his back to the 300, still looking at the men who wanted to join them, Leonidas shouted, Spartans, what is your profession? The 300 raised their shields and in one accord shouted the Spartan battle cry, ah, ooh. Fighting was the Spartans' profession. Would to God that Christians in the United States had the same courage and commitment to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ as the 300 had to fighting. If we are soldiers in the army of the Lord, then our responsibility is to, to defend God's kingdom and the good news against opposition. In the Bible, sinners are considered to be living in spiritual darkness. In the Bible, Sinners are considered spiritually blind. A completely blind person sees only darkness. Jesus came and died to rescue sinners from the darkness that comes from not having a relationship with the living God. Jesus came to show us God's light and he told us to walk in God's light. In 1 John, John tells us that God is light and there is no darkness at all in God. We know that God doesn't like darkness because when darkness enveloped the universe in the beginning, the first thing God did was say, let there be light and light appeared. Then God separated light from darkness. God distinguished light from darkness. Light and darkness aren't similar. Light and darkness are very different. From the beginning, scripture associates God with light and sin and evil with darkness. In 1 John, God is not simply associated with light. John states that God is light. And there is no darkness in God at all. Now, if we accept the fact that there is no darkness in God, then Christians should make the commitment to let God cleanse us of the darkness in us. All who are not in relationship with God are full of darkness. Those who begin a relationship with God need to understand that being cleansed from darkness is a process. Complete cleansing doesn't happen overnight. Cleansing happens as spiritual growth happens. The closer we grow to God in our relationship with God, the more darkness the Holy Spirit cleanses from within us. As we are cleansed from darkness, we are equipped by the Spirit to shine the light of God brighter from within our hearts. When evil, terrible acts are committed, they are committed by people whose souls are dark. It is people with dark souls who sustain darkness in the world. We are living in dark times. Recently, we have had a mass killing at a grocery store in Buffalo, New York, which was definitely racist. We had a mass killing in Uvalde, Texas at an elementary school. There, the shooter was Latino, and all of the children but one and the teachers he killed were Latino. Then a few days ago, an African-American man killed four people at himself in a hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Darkness does not discriminate. Darkness will use anybody and traumatize everybody. There have been, there have been 233 mass killings this year already 
and it's just June the 5th. I haven't mentioned the number of children who have been killed by handguns this year. Guns are the number one killer of children. Not COVID, not cancer, not drugs, not child trafficking. Guns are the number one killer of children in the United States of America. We live in dark times. These are dark days. We continue to suffer with record inflation. Gas prices are at a record high. The prices of certain grocery items are at record highs. Parents and babies continue to suffer with the shortage of baby formula. These are dark days. Thousands of people continue to try to cross our southern border illegally, and some of them drown in the Rio Grande River from time to time. The threat of death is everywhere. People are scared, people are insecure, people are nervous, people are frantic, and people are stressed out. Evil is happening to someone every day and night. Someone suffers traumatically every day and night. I remind you that under different circumstances, it could be any of us, and some of us might be nervous about our lives right now. Therefore, my attitude is, no one is safe until we all are safe. No one is secure until we all are secure. No one should be at peace until we all are at peace. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I'm saying a threat to a person's life anywhere is a threat to a person's life everywhere. If children can be killed anywhere, Children can be killed everywhere. If people can be shot in a hospital in Tulsa, they can be shot in a hospital everywhere. Public safety must become the top priority of the government and of the body of Christ because God gives life. Because God gives life, everybody has a right to live until God decides otherwise. Christians need to make that clear. We live in some dark times. The thing about being followers of Jesus is that we're not supposed to surrender to the darkness. We're not supposed to feel helpless when confronted by evil. We're not supposed to get used to the evil of violence in our families, nor in our cities, nor in our nation, nor in the world. Light is more powerful than darkness. Way more powerful than darkness. Even the light from the flame on the head of a matchstick repels this much darkness from in front of our faces. The brighter the light, the more darkness is removed. This is one of the facts that spurs several New Testament authors of Scripture to proclaim that the body of Christ and believers in that body cannot be defeated by darkness and therefore not by a sinful world. Darkness never defeats light. Darkness never defeats light. Christians who know who they are in Christ Jesus should never be hopeless in the midst of adversity. We should never believe that God won't change dark situations. We should never be afraid of darkness. Jesus told us that we are the light of the world. He commanded us to let our light so shine that people will see our good works and glorify our heavenly Father. Good works done for God's glory will overcome the darkness of evil. In Romans, the Apostle Paul tells us that we can overcome evil with good. God's goodness is light, and it can conquer darkness. Light always conquers darkness. Darkness has never defeated light. Darkness has never snuffed out light. Jesus called us the light of the world. Christians who are apathetic and have decided that it doesn't do any good to try to defeat darkness because nothing is going to change, so we just need to get used to it. 
Apathetic Christians need to repent from such a lack of faith. Apathy also represents a lack of knowledge about the power of light against darkness. Against darkness, light always wins. Christians must be sure that we are walking in the light. A lot of Christians claim to be in fellowship with God, yet they are still walking in darkness. And while John calls them liars, I will add that they are lying to themselves. I suppose that the greatest darkness in one's soul is not admitting that we are very capable of lying to ourselves and believing the lies we tell ourselves. If I claim to be in fellowship with God, if I claim to be in fellowship with the light, my life should exhibit the evidence that I am in fellowship with the light. I should be able to tell if I'm exhibiting the evidence that I am in fellowship, I am in relationship with the light. If I don't see the evidence in my life that I am in fellowship with the light, then I need to recognize that by continuing to claim that I am in fellowship with God, I am not only lying to others, I am lying to myself. We need to be honest with ourselves. If we aren't shining and do what it takes to begin letting our little lights shine. Shining begins with confessing that we are sinners. If we confess our sins, Jesus is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Jesus forgiving us of our sins makes us new creations. Forgiving us of our sins frees us from living in darkness, and we begin living in light. We begin a relationship with the light. That relationship molds us into lights so that we can begin to shine or exemplify the light of God. It is a little light when our new life begins. But we're supposed to grow in Christ, and as we grow, our lights grow brighter and brighter. There are people who will say that they've never sinned. There are people who will say that sin isn't a real thing and that they aren't guilty of anything. There are parents who don't want their children to learn about slavery because somebody told them that learning about slavery in the Confederate South makes their children feel guilty. The interesting thing about that is most children don't tell their parents that they feel guilty. So who are those parents listening to and why? Teachers don't teach the history of Southern slavery to make children feel guilty. They teach history to inform children of the evils their ancestors did so that hopefully when the children grow up, they won't repeat those evils when they are leaders in this nation. Behold, white supremacists are doing their best to bring the Confederacy back. White supremacists are doing their best to bring Southern racial hatred and inequality back. There's a political party that now exists to bring Southern racial hatred and inequality back. Some Texas representative named Gomert in a debate, uh, in a hearing about uh, gun safety. And he said to the group, to the committee, he said, you are trying to claim that we don't have a heart. And I said, yeah, and they shouldn't claim it. They ought to say it outright. If you don't want to do something about the gun violence in the country today, you, all of the children, let alone the adults, all of the children that are being killed, you don't care and therefore you don't have a heart. Teaching white supremacists American history has apparently been a waste of time. Hatred against other human beings for any reason is evil. Christians have a responsibility to shine against racism, against sexism, against classism, against homophobia, against xenophobia, against inequality in education and inequality in opportunities to live well. People who advocate for evil, people who participate in evil are in darkness and we have to shine on them to try to help them see the light. This is why Jesus doesn't allow us to hate anybody. If we hate those who hate us, we're in as much darkness as they are, and we can't help them see the light. Can the blind lead the blind? 
One reason why Jesus told us to love our enemies is because our enemies live in, in darkness. But Jesus wants our enemies to be given the choice to receive light. Christians are the ones the Holy Spirit uses to give those who live in darkness the opportunities to choose light. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Jesus gave it to me. I'm going to let it shine. All in my home, I'm going to let it shine. All in my church, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. One of the prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming of the Christ found in the book of Isaiah is the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned on them. It isn't anyone's fault that they are in darkness. We were born into a dark world. So God decided that all who believe in Jesus should become lights representing Jesus in this dark world. Given those who still live in darkness the opportunity to live in the light as we do. Children are afraid of the dark. The Apostle Paul stated, when I was a child, I acted like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Mature people aren't afraid of the dark. We are the light of the world, and we live in the light. Darkness cannot defeat us. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus because we are children of the light. And light always defeats darkness. Light always defeats darkness. If people want to know why they should give their lives to Jesus, it's because light always defeats darkness. If people want to know why they should give Jesus a chance, it's because light always defeats darkness. If people want to know why they should trust Jesus with their lives, it's because light always defeats darkness. Light is some unimaginable number versus O. Darkness has never defeated light. Light always defeats darkness. The only reason it's going to get dark tonight is because the earth is going to turn it on its axis. But the sun will still be shining on the other side. Darkness never defeats light. Light always defeats darkness. So let us walk in the light, beautiful light. Come where the dew drops. Mercy shine bright. Shine all around us. By day and by night, Jesus, the light of the world. Amen. Savior 
Shine bright, you know we'll shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world, you know we'll walk in the light, that beautiful, beautiful light. Yeah, come with, come with the new drops of mercy. Shine bright, shine all around us by day and by night, Jesus, the light of the world. And the church said, Amen. There may be someone who has been watching by live stream. Or you have decided to give your life to the light, to give your life to Jesus. And you'd like to know how to do that. Well, there's an address on the, on the screen. That address will lead you to a contact page. I need you to give me your cell phone number or your email address or both. Let me know that you want to give your life to Jesus. I'll be happy to get in touch with you and to help you welcome Jesus into your heart and into your life and welcome you into the Woodland Christian Church community and the body of Christ. If you already gave your life to Christ at some point in your life, and you were active in church at some point in your life, maybe years ago, maybe just a couple of years ago. But now you've seen the need to have a church home. You'd like Woodland to be that church home. Do what I ask the folks who need to give their lives to Christ. Give me your contact information on the web address on the screen, your cell phone number, your email address. Let me know you want to become a member of the Woodland Christian Church. I'll be more than happy to get in touch with you and welcome you into the Woodland Christian Church community. And if you're in the sanctuary and want to get Woodland to be your church home, just see me after the benediction. We will welcome you. Thank you for doing that. church said amen. Remember this, 
Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. We want to pause right now to thank you for the contributions, the tithes and offerings that you give to the Lord here at Woodland. We want to thank you so much. We really appreciate you for the tithes and offerings that you give to God here at Woodland in order that Woodland may be able to perform the ministries that God has assigned this congregation to perform. We thank you for your commitment to bring your tithes and offerings here, whether you Send your check in by mail, bring your contributions with you when you come to the sanctuary, whether you give electronically, as you see on the screen. We want to thank you for what you give. We also want to thank God for you, for we know that if God was not blessing you the way God is, you wouldn't be able to make the contributions that you make. And so we want to thank God for you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're so grateful to you for the people upon whose hearts you have laid the Woodland Christian Church. We thank you for those who have made the commitment to bring their tithes and offerings here to you here. We thank you, Lord, that those offerings and tithes are brought so that Woodland can continue to perform the ministries you have assigned this congregation to perform. We are grateful to you for the people upon whose hearts you have laid the desire and the dedication to give their tithes and offerings to you here. We thank you for blessing them as you have promised in your word. Thank you for blessing folks for their giving that they will, might be able and will continue to give to show their appreciation for all that you do for them. We also recognize, Lord, there are folks who really don't have it to give today. But it's in their hearts. If they had it, they would give it. And you know it's in their hearts. And because you know it's in their hearts, we thank you for blessing them so that at a future opportunity, they will be able to show their appreciation to you by having something they can return to you with thanksgiving. So, Lord, we are grateful to you for how you continue to sustain Woodland through the people who bring their tithes and offerings to you here we thank you for them. And so we just ask that you will continue. And we thank you for continuing to see that Woodland has all of the resources that it needs to continue to serve you and be a light in this dark world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Oh, Lord, I thank you. You, thank you, thank you. Lord, I thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I just thank you. Thank you all the day. Oh, my oh, life. life. Oh, Lord, I thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, I thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I just thank, thank you all the day.
the church said amen. amen. It is time to prepare our hearts to receive our Lord's Supper. Allow me to read a familiar passage of Scripture to most of you from the Gospel of John. These are the words of Jesus. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews then began to argue among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. This is the Lord's table for the Lord's people. All believers are welcomed and encouraged to participate in this supper with us. And if you didn't get a cup of juice and a wafer when you walked in, raise your hand if you'd like to participate in the supper as we get ready. Raise your hand and uh, our deacon will see to it that you get a communion kit. Amen. You at home still have time to get a little piece of bread, a little cup of juice, a cup of water, and you can participate in this supper with us. The two attitudes we ought to have as we spiritually prepare to receive our Lord's Supper. The first attitude is an attitude of repentance. We have fallen short of God's expectations of us this past week. We ought to acknowledge that. There is a verse of scripture in the New Testament that states, if we confess our sins, he, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is an attitude of repentance that allows us to participate in this supper in a humble manner. And we should be humble when we receive our Lord's Supper because Jesus did not have to die for us. Jesus was not forced to go to Calvary for us. He volunteered and he did it while the human race was in sin. Nowhere in the Bible will you find where Jesus said, if I die for you, will you then believe in me? He just went to the cross to do our Heavenly Father's will. And the fact that he died for us while the human race was still in sin shows that Jesus has faith in us even while we're in sin. He has faith that we're going to come to the light, that we're going to believe in him. And so he died for the human race while the human race was in sin. That ought to humble us. And so... By having an attitude of repentance, we can receive the bread that represents his body and the fruit of the vine that represents his blood. We can receive it in a humble manner. The other attitude we ought to have is an attitude of gratitude. Only Jesus qualified to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Only Jesus qualified to be the one who could give his life as a ransom for the human race. Only Jesus could do it and he was willing to do it, and he did it. And in three days later, he arose from the dead. And we should be very grateful to Jesus for what he did. All because he loves us and he loves our Father in heaven. He went to the cross for us. We should be grateful. Right now, let every heart who believes say, thank you, Jesus. Jesus died for you. We are now in the hands of our elders. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the, the new covenant between God and his people an agreement confirmed 
with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. The elements will be prayed for by Elder Arnetta Howard. Let us pray. Most loving God, we come to you with thankful and grateful hearts. We thank you for Jesus, the light of the world. We thank you for this table that represents Jesus. Because he went to Calvary, because his body was broken, because his blood, his blood was shed, we have access to that light to share with others. As we eat of the bread that represents that body that was broken so that we could be made whole. As we drink the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that was shed for the remission of sins. Lord, bless us to be a blessing. Bless us to look for opportunities and areas where we can shine the light of Jesus and spread the good news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us eat and drink together. Oh, it is Jesus. Yes, it is Jesus. It's Jesus in my soul. But I have touched him of his garment and his blood has made me whole. Oh, it is Jesus. Yes, it is Jesus. Jesus in my soul. I have touched the him of his garment and his blood has made me whole. There is a fountain field with blood drawn from be man your thing and send us punch but lose all the guilty sin lose all the guilty sin lose all the guilty sin and sin not plunge said a mumbling word he never said a mumbling word he never said a mumbling word for me you know one day when I will long know he died on the cross I know it was the blood for me you know he's coming back again he's coming back again Coming back again for me. You know, one day when I was lost, Jesus died upon the cross. I know it was the blood for me. Oh, yes, I know it 
All who are able, let us stand for the benediction, please. Now the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do God's will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in God's sight, to whom be glory forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. God bless you and have a blessed week.